Good evening. In case you're watching us this evening, we need to thank you for sticking with us on Urban TV. This is Checkpoint. And once again, I'm Conan Singh. This time to really be with you on this show. And in a special way today, we are on Makere Hill. You must be wondering why. Yes, we are on Makere Hill, one of the hills of Kampala City. Well, because it is Makere University. One of the greatest and oldest universities sits on this hill. You might be wondering why then we have the show here. Tonight we have Professor Barnabas Nawangwe, who is actually the Vice Chancellor of Makere University. And while we're here, in a few months from now, Makere will be celebrating 100 years of its existence. Yes, it's been 100 years. Those are 10 decades. It's been a long journey, full of challenges, but also good moments. And Makere will have a time to celebrate that for all the people that have gone through this institution. You'll be having a sister, brother, or a friend, your fiance, your husband, that probably went through this institution, or even your neighbor. You don't necessarily have to have gone through Macquarie University. But most important is that we celebrate this institution for its contribution to the country, but also the entire world. So, this evening, good evening, Professor. Good evening, viewers. I'm privileged to have you on the show tonight. Thank you so much for sparing time, being with us on the hill today to be able to discuss a number of issues on Macquarie University. So, Professor, a number of people look at Macquarie University in different aspects. Some looking at it for its history, they look at a good side. Others look at it for the bad side. But well, most importantly, that it sets a record that is unmatched by any other institution in this country. But how would you define Macquarie University all this time since you are the Vice Chancellor? Thank you very much, Conan. I would be surprised if any Ugandan looks at Makere for any bad side. Because this institution, I think, is probably the most important asset for the people of Uganda. I hear you right. Yes. So I would expect that everybody values their asset, irrespective of some small issues that may be coming out of the university here now and then. But by far and large, this is a, a very good asset for the people of Uganda, which has served this nation and the entire region for the last 100 years diligently and effectively. Exactly. I'm going to pick on that. Diligently and effectively. What are some of those milestones actually look at and say, well, this institution has done this, this, and this? Well, let's go through a brief history of the institution. Sure. Makere started as a, a technical school in 1922, January. Sure. And uh, it was offering basically artisanal trades, basically masonry and carpentry. And within a very short time, it was transformed into a college, which meant that uh, it started offering certificates for non-artisanal uh, you know, uh, disciplines, including medicine, agriculture, and veter veterinary. So it somehow transformed into what you would call a normal college, not just an artisanal school. And the, at that time, of course, the aim was to create a cadre for supporting the colonial government, especially the, the, the colonial masters. But uh, uh, the institution grew, and uh, by 1925, it had the, uh, started offering non-school uh, I mean, uh, uh, non certificates. It started offering certificates of a higher institution level. By 1943, it uh, had become a college of the University of London, and actually started offering uh, diplomas and degrees of the University of London. So it had now grown into an institution that sort of supported not just the uh, basic needs of the colonial masters, but actually producing human resource for the development of the country, even if it was still under the colonial rule. And in 1963, we became the University of East Africa. So we now became an independent university offering degrees by ourselves. But it was the University of East Africa with the colleges at Makerere. So Makerere was the mother university, but there was a, a, the Makerere University uh, a, as the University of East Africa, with the colleges at Nairobi 
and uh, and Dar es Salaam. And the arrangement now, the, this was now a, a university serving independent Africa. And it was a general trend in all independent countries in Africa that every country wanted to have a university as a symbol of independence. Sure. And so Makere was the symbol of independence for the three East African countries, uh, producing the necessary human source for a complementary development of the country. And so the three colleges or of the, the three campuses of the university were all tasked with producing the cadre in the different areas. So Makere produced doctors and the, uh, I think the doctors and the social scientists uh, and, the, and agriculture. Then uh, uh, Nairobi produced engineers and veterinary doctors and Dar es Salaam produced economists and lawyers, okay? But there were disciplines which are also common to the rest, like teachers. Teachers are required everywhere and in large numbers. So that was now the independent stage. In 1970, uh, the three East African countries thought each one should now have its own university because the demand for higher uh, qualifications yeah, was now big. Yeah, it was broad, it was big. So every country thought they should have their own university producing all those. And hence, the creation or the uplifting of Makere University as the first national university of Uganda, yeah. providing comprehensive education covering all the, all, the, all the fields. And now over 50 universities sit in this country, with Makere still standing what do you see right now? Because we pay credit to all the vice chancellors that have been in this place and all the people who have worked for this institution up to this present time. It has been a long journey. For what you've just said, it has been years and years of dedication and support for the development of this university. Now, where do you see, since right now you are the sitting vice chancellor here, where do you see the university in the next five to ten years, especially that it's celebrating its hundred years this year? Well, I, I think what we can say is uh, up to maybe two, three years ago, uh, the university was concentrating a lot on producing human resources, high quality human resources. So we offer degrees, I mean, bachelors, masters, and PhDs in practically every field that is uh, offered here at Mackay University. Uh, we took a decision that yes, we have been doing this, we have been doing it extremely well. We are known all over the world as a, a university that produces very high quality uh, graduates in all these fields. But uh, we have also been doing research. But doing research not at the level that we want to do. Because for historical reasons, we increased our numbers, we had large numbers of students, and the uh, our professors were very busy all the time teaching, marking, teaching, marking, very little time for research. And yet we all know that research in the modern world is the cornerstone of development. Yeah, it informs innovation and industrial development. Yes. It yeah. Exactly. So we said, no, we are doing a very good job, but we can do even a better job for this country by concentrating more on research. We are not saying we are leaving teaching. Teaching will remain, including undergraduate teaching and uh, postgraduate teaching. But we have built a huge capacity. We have more than a thousand PhDs on this hill, which is more than half of all the PhDs in the country. Did you just say over a thousand PhDs? Yes. In terms of the people you've taken through the process, right? Members of staff. Who are still here? Yes, who are on this hill. And our PhD holders. Yes. Oh, that makes it the, the greatest institution because they are the institutions that are struggling even to get 10 PhDs. Well, uh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> without getting there. It, it, you know, it, it signals what Macquarie is obviously to the entire region. Yes. It's not a joke if you have all those PhDs on one hill. That is true. And uh, I think it is only the University of Ghana which might have a little bit higher number. Uh, of PhDs than Macquarie University. Which explains the fifth, the fifth position ranking of the institution then. Exactly. 
Okay. So these 1,000 PhDs and the others who have masters, uh, so what I want to say is in about five years, we will not have any bachelors in this university as a member of staff. They will either all have masters or PhDs. Really? In another five years, everybody will have a PhD. Okay. Yes. That's so all this huge potential. I love that. I hope people can listen to that. Next five years, no bachelor's order lecturing in this institution. That's fantastic. Yes. So with all this huge investment that this country has made in this country, I mean in this university, why would we continue concentrating only on teaching? Yet there is another 50 universities that can do that equally well. Does that mean you're going to remove the undergrads? No. What we are the strategy is because if you want to be a research lady university, which is our strategy, you ask me if next five to ten years. Sure. Our strategy is for ten years for yes. now, yeah. but we really want to look what will it be fifty, a hundred years, sure. another one hundred years. But sure. the, the strategy for for now is the next ten years, and so the strategy is to transform the university completely into a research led university, yeah. which means. If you want to be research lady, the research is actually done by your graduate students, supervised by the professors. So if you have more graduate students, you are able to do more research, you are, more, you are able to do and produce more innovations, okay. and hence more contribution to the economy. Okay. So that's how we think we will transform our economy. And so we are going to reduce, gradually reduce the number of undergraduate students and gradually increase the number of postgraduate students. You have funds for research because I know no university in this country has even a required percentage of a normal research to be a good research-based university. Even Makai itself with the funding from government and donors doesn't even meet 50% of the required research funding. Am I right, right on that? You are right because we have created huge potential. Okay. But if I told you that because of this huge potential, because of the large number of uh, PhD holders we have, they are all writing proposals, proposals for research sending funding. them around the world. Okay. On a daily basis, I'm signing research proposals. And maybe on a daily basis, I'm signing research agreements. As a result of the proposals, our staff are winning the research grants from the various uh, research granting organizations around the world. I met a German professor a few years ago, I think 2012, but he told me something which shocked me. He says, you see, if you want people to fund your research, then very, be very prepared that the research they are doing is not for your country, well, most of the time. So if the donors are funding our research, where does that leave us? Yet a few minutes ago we agreed that we are doing this for our country's innovation and development, and we're just doing research for foreigners as they do their work in Africa. It is not completely right. Okay. But it is also true that once the research is funded by somebody else, they have an interest in it. Sure. But what are, uh, most of our donors these days, and especially those who are institutional, they are what we call institutional donors, mm -hmm. like CEDA of Sweden, NORAD, they actually ask you, what are your priorities? What do you want to research in? We give them our priorities. Which gives us an upper hand. Exactly. The research being made. They may have uh, the advantage that they know what we are doing, okay. and they could also probably make use of it, but it is our research. Okay. However, since last year, since last financial year, the government has started funding research at Macquarie University and in no, with not little money. How much do they give you, Professor? 30 billion shillings for How research. How much would you need? Let me tell you. The 30 billion shillings which for the first time, when we put out a call for proposals, we received 700 proposals. We were able to fund only 200. Not because the others were bad. They were all very good proposals. But the money was enough for 200. What does that show you? That we, if we were to fund all the good proposals in this university, 
we will need three times that money. So we would probably be looking for 100 billion shillings. Billion shillings. And they give any financial year. What are the alternative sources of funding in this regard? Apart from donors, probably, where are you going to get more money? Because now it's going to be donors and government. If the money doesn't come, that may not work. Well, as I told you, uh, we have institutional arrangements with the, what we call our development partners, okay. or whom you call donors. Sure. They give us lump sums out of the proposals that have been uh, uh, submitted by the university because we do an internal uh, you know, process through which we receive the, the, the proposals and then we give to the donors. The donors say, yes, we are able to give you so much money for research, maybe for the next five years. So we have money from that, those institutionalized uh, funds. Yeah. But the largest source of research funding is from the various research awarding institutions around the world where individual researchers or groups of researchers can write proposals, of course with the support of the university, okay. and they get money from them. That is the biggest source of funding. So if, for example, I'll tell you that the government is giving us 30 billion now for a year, which is about $8 million. From the major institutional uh, partners, we are getting maybe something like $50 million per year. Our research uh, budget is almost $100 million. So the rest of the money is coming from these proposals by individuals. And that's where the largest amount of research funding is. And that is common around the world. Sure. Yes. Fantastic. This is because you've just joined us. This is Checkpoint, and this is Urban TV. And we are at Macquarie University, the oldest university in this country, and the fifth leading university, if I'm to take the Times, uh, what Times ranking, the higher education ranking right. So I hope you will be able to learn something on our show tonight. Professor, the Times keep changing, and so many things keep evolving. No one knew when they were setting up Macquarie several years ago, there will be a day they would have COVID. Meanwhile, people watching us must be wondering why we're, we're not having our masks. Well, we were at a distance, but we have our masks here. Professor has his own mask there. But we just wanted to be very audible, but we're at a good distance. COVID hit the entire country. It paralyzed everything. And Mackay, like all the other institutions, were completely paralyzed. And I'm right on that, right? So what measures do we have as a university to make sure if this ever happens, we will come out, we'll be stronger when it happens, and we can come out stronger because I realized it must have destabilized the operations of this university. Talking about research, everything must have gone to stands. Yes, yes, you are right. Of course, Makerere could not be spared. The whole world was paralyzed sure. by COVID-19. Sure. It is slowly recovering. But uh, I'll tell you that Makerere has a very unique character. Sure. It has unusual level of resilience. Uh, even after COVID struck, of course we had it closed like all other institutions, but research continued. Research continued. So there are groups of researchers who are given special permission, especially research which would go bad if there is nobody attending to certain to the experiments where you have reagents, which have a lifetime, and that kind of thing. So research continued, albeit on a much smaller scale. Eventually, when the lockdown was, uh, was lifted, people went back massively to their research. And I will tell you that uh, it is during the COVID year when we produce the largest number of publications in a single year. Really? Yes. For the first time, we crossed the 1,000 mark. Wow. Over. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> so that means that this lecture has probably had more time to concentrate on research, which takes us back to the other bit where you don't have to be in university, it's merely teaching. 
exactly that and, and why we need to reduce oh. the load on teaching yeah. and give people more time to do research so in respect of whatever we went through thanks to covid now we can see why this university needs to be a research-based university well COVID, i had never known that covid was a, in a way a blessing in disguise in for Makere. apart from that huge number of publications yeah we were able now to do what we have been planning to do for a long time, institutionalizing online distance and e-learning at Makerere. Wow. Because now we, we had no alternative. We had to improvise and make sure that we move massively to online distance and e-learning. And through that, we were able to complete the academic year within last calendar year, and all our students had examinations by the end of this. We are going to have the very first graduation online. Yes. <laughs> and I'm privileged to be part of a student's graduating ah, online. Congratulations in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Professor. Now, Professor, in regard to the same thing of coronavirus, should, should we say that right now we've hit a mark where the university we feel it's on takeoffs, takeoff level for online learning? Yes, yes. Now, online learning is fully institutionalized. Of course, we still have challenges. Okay. Uh, our, our platform, which we use, yeah. still requires to be strengthened. The servers need to be strengthened because the, the capacity was not designed at the time for the, for the levels at which we are now doing online teaching. Okay. We also have issues with the students. Not all the students have the gadgets. Mm -hmm. We are working with the financial institutions, particularly Stanbic Bank, to create a laptop scheme, a laptop purchase scheme, where students can purchase laptops over a long time, paying a little money every month, okay. so that by the end they complete their studies, they have paid for the laptop, and yes. they take away the laptop. We are also creating a laptop bank, so we are purchasing enough laptops to put in the colleges, where all the lecturers have access to laptops and the and they can use them. We are strengthening them well. That is the system we use for online. So we are strengthening the servers there, and the, we are already making good progress. Okay. We have negotiated with the service providers, MTA, NAFRISEL, Airtel, to zero rate our websites where the material for on, online teaching is, so the students access them free of charge. Okay. Of course, uh, they are still uh, lessons that have to take place maybe through Zoom because somebody really doesn't know how to use the Mwele system. There, unfortunately, the students mm. must buy some data. But if they are use, using the Mwele system, they don't have to pay any okay. money. So we are doing everything necessary to make it, to make the online programs accessible to all our students. Sure. That's fantastic. So looking at COVID, and I know being a university and talking about authentic learning, now this is uh, the, the, the talk of the authentic learning, where we have education that meets the needs of the community. Did you get into what other innovations? I know some, but probably the listeners would want to know the innovations you went through as a university or you came up with to be able to respond to the needs of the community and the country. Are you, some of them I know they haven't reached the final stage. How far have you gone? I think uh, Makerere's contribution to the management of COVID is uh, in the common knowledge to everybody. Actually, what uh, I would like to say probably is that the best of Makerere came out during COVID. Sure. That everybody was anxious to say, what can I do? We used to think the best was when you came up with an electric car. <laughs> <laughs> no, the best of Makerere came out during COVID because now okay. this was an issue affecting our country. True. And, the of so many people. and as you know, COVID revealed a lot of things that everybody abandoned us and went to do their own thing. Exactly. We were left by our own. Sure. So we had to be innovative in order, yeah, in order to survive mm -hmm. and also to recover. Sure. And so Makerere came out during the COVID and a lot of innovations came out. First of all, a lot of our colleagues were on the national committee. COVID committee, giving advice to government. And those are the people you always hear the president saying, my scientists. So those scientists, a big number of them were from Makerere, giving advice to the government on how to manage the situation. Then a lot of innovations came out. And they, of course, you know about the ventilator, 
the ventilator, uh, the, the trials of the plasma. Uh, now we, we have got other, we, we had a lot of innovation things like uh, uh, wash handing facilities that could be used without people touching and so on. Uh, the people coming up with the facial masks uh, was also another innovation. Uh, and, and quite a few others. Yeah, so on, you know, on when we, co we made a special call for uh, proposals on COVID, we got 200 proposals from all colleges. Because the COVID is not only about medicine and so on, yeah. it is also on how people behave. And so we got proposals from... Uh, there's a lot we didn't know about this institution. Ah, from it's good to have you on the show tonight on yeah, Checkpoint. <laughs> from the humanities, <laughs> from uh, the engineers, from medicine, from uh, veterinary medicine, sure. from law. Every college had ideas on how to manage. Even law. What did the law guys come up with? <laughs> and that will be for another day. <laughs> but I would, love to, I would love to know what the law guys came up with. Yes, there is nobody in the university who said, I can't do anything about COVID. Everybody had something to do. They all came up with proposals. Many of them are actually being implemented. Okay, that's very interesting. That's interesting. Professor, obviously, if, you've, if we ever finish this interview without talking about remuneration of staff and the brain drain in this institution or any other institution in this country, it will be cheating. The several lecturers who are watching this show and the students. I know this institution has always had a number of issues on funding because of the unit costs that probably does not meet the real standard or expectation that should have met, but also maybe combining so many things, but also the fact that the lecturers do not feel properly remunerated. What is your take on that? Well, As uh, the uh, university <laughs> celebrates 100 years. I think I have been very clear on this and everybody knows and uh, a lot of people have uh, made comments about my views. Yes, I know government has continuously Yes. been supporting the improve, improvement of renumeration and funding. Exactly. But I would want to have your complete view exactly. of this. I think, what, first of all, let me say this. As universities in the modern world, the modern universities, sure. are no longer just citadels of knowledge. Yeah. They are expected to be transformative ag agents of society. And that's why for us we are saying we want to do more research, we want to do more innovation, we want to transform our society, our economy, through the research and innovations. That's one thing. It implies that if you want your economy to grow, universities must contribute to that, that's to making true. the economy grow. That's very true. It also means that if I am a professor and I want to earn more money, I must work hard, come up with innovations to go into the economy, transform the economy, grow the revenue base, and then demand that the person for whom I did the research should pay me better. It cannot be that I demand to be paid more from a, an empty basket, sure. okay, <laughs> and deplete the basket, and then expect that it Before will be we ask for more, the question should be, exactly. what have we done ourselves? Exactly. What can we do for our country sure. so that things are better for everybody, including us? Sure. It is true that since the 80s, Makerere had been many times on strike, staff striking, demanding for what we then call the living wage. Because the, definitely the salaries were extremely low. And it was difficult for lecturers to make ends meet. And this, so they would then go and try to make ends meet instead of being in the classroom or in the laboratory. For a long time, government did not have the funds. And so that's why we introduced the private sponsorship scheme to try and uh, get money. The council kept using that resource to improve the salaries of the staff, until it, be, it reached a stage when it could not do that anymore. Mm. There was just no more money to further increase. Sure. At that stage, the government came in, because my guess is they had now mm. revived the economy to a level that they could now contribute. Sure. 
And so the government came in and started enhancing salaries. And they, they enhanced the salaries uh, until everybody reached the level which we had demanded in 2016, which was increase our salaries by 100%. The University Council tried to do that through a scheme which we called incentive, where everybody's take home was raised by 70%, but after two years it became non-sustainable, and the university couldn't even afford to pay that money. And so at that stage the government came in, raised the salaries for everybody until everybody was getting 100% of what had been demanded. So the government in a way fulfilled our demands. However, the president made, the president made a pledge that he wanted to pay a professor 15 million so that Uganda's professor remains here and doesn't go looking. And that pledge continued. And uh, last year, financial year, it was fulfilled. So our professor now earns 15 million. Everybody else. Which is almost the highest in the region. On the continent. On the continent? Yes. Fantastic. Well, you can say our salaries are at par with South Africa now, wow. which was the highest. So for a professor, they really have got a very good deal. The rest of the staff also have got a, a good deal, but the government is still... Tr truth is, I've been... I've, guys were ahead, people were heading private institutions. They said it's very hard to hire anyone from a government institution because of the high amount of money you pay in government institutions. Well, because now, obviously, with the increment, it's very hard to get anyone from Makere to teach in any private institution nowadays. Yeah, well, I wouldn't uh, understand anybody who... <laughs> <laughs> who would want to get in on from Makere? <laughs> because this is... Oh, well. And as we will take a break, this is Checkpoint, just in case you've just joined us. We'll take a break, and we'll be back with a Checkpoint. We are with Professor Barnabas Nwango, the Vice Chancellor of Makere University, as an institution looks at the celebration of 100 years. Remember, by the way, if you forget anything, don't forget that on Thursday, we will be having this week a special edition of a supplement that will be running only in New Vision. And they will be saying or having a number of things about Makere's journey, a number of things they've done, especially at this institution. You cannot miss that special magazine. It comes once in a lifetime. I don't think in the time I've been in journalism, I've seen this kind of magazine. It's one that you just cannot miss. And remember, it's free of charge, but only in the copy of the New Vision on Thursday this week. We'll be back. <laughs>